personal encounter. When I visited Palmo at her nunnery in northern India, the nuns were fun-spirited. Their laughter made me feel welcome. I felt so at ease being there. Palmo and I had a real good laugh about the fact that I actually tripped coming into her room. I nearly stumbled right into her arms. I had taken such careful attention to carry out what I had imagined to be all the proper rituals of meeting an important Buddhist leader. I guess my nervousness got the best of me. It was embarrassing, but it was met with her humor, her kindness. And so I had that firsthand experience of what she teaches about humor. She says, quote, we need to encourage ourselves and our fellow practitioners to lighten up. Stop taking ourselves so seriously. Sometimes I think the seventh paramita should be a sense of humor. Well, being with Jetsamna Tinsen Palmo was more compelling to me than reading a book about Buddhist practice. She was the practice. In her presence, the purpose of spiritual practice became really clear to me. It's not to set ourselves apart from other people, but rather to return to our most natural way of being. Then, as a practitioner, we're relatable. It's like we've become one with other people. My visit with Palmo gave me an experience of the freeing realm in which the doingness of spiritual practice gives way to the sheer joy of being. There's no gap between the Dharma and the person. Conversation with Jetsumna Tenson Palmo. Love and Loving Kindness. In the book, Cave in the Snow, I got the sense that you went into retreat for many years, not only for yourself, but for all beings. Would you say that our spiritual work is of benefit to the world, even if we're alone? Absolutely. In the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, which is not just in Tibet and India, but also China, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam, the whole motivation for spiritual work is based on compassion. As one begins to see with more clarity, one recognizes what the problem is. All beings want happiness and want to avoid suffering. But, Because we are deluded and don't see clearly, we act in ways that are calculated to create suffering for ourselves and others. And we do this in pursuit of what we think will bring happiness. Modern day society is mainly based on what the Buddha described as the three poisons, our greed and our aggression both of which are rooted in our delusion about an ego. The self is right in the middle of everything. And we think this self has to be satisfied and defended. The more we inflate our ego and encourage it, the more we zero in on me, 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 the more desperate we become, hoping that if we just keep going, Somehow it's all going to end up in one great bonanza of everlasting joy. But in fact, you just end up taking more Valium. (laughs) So yes, the motivation for the Mahayana Buddhist is based on seeing that we all inherently have Buddha nature. That's our true nature not the ephemeral personality we grasp at. By nature, we should all be Buddhas, but because of our delusion, we often act more like demons. We create so much suffering for ourselves and for the world around us, when our potential is so incredible, 
Look at what we do with it. This intelligence that we are so proud of. Look at what we do with it. So it often becomes demonic. Therefore, the aspiration for the spiritual path is rooted in compassion. To attain enlightenment in order to help others also to be liberated. Without masters, how will we break free? Well, that's certainly true for me. The most profound experience of love I've ever had was with a master, that is, my spiritual teacher. But in the West, love is seen mainly as romantic love. Partly, it's the poverty of our language. People say, I love ice cream. I love my children. I love my partner. I love all sentient beings. These are very different emotions they're talking about. But we have only the one word. When we talk about love in the English language, basically it's meaningless because everyone has their own idea of what they mean by love. In Buddhism, people talk about loving kindness just to get a different feeling. You don't have loving kindness toward ice cream. In terms of loving kindness, where do we begin? The Buddha himself taught, when we cultivate loving kindness and compassion, we start with ourselves. That is very important. At first, we start with giving ourselves loving kindness. We have to give ourselves compassion. We have to befriend ourselves. Even though ultimately the ego is something to be dissolved and recognized for what it is, nonetheless, for almost the whole of the path, we take our ego along with us. It's our sense of self. Therefore, we need to have a healthy sense of self because that's what we're going to work with as we travel on the path. All spiritual paths deal with how to have a happy, healthy, enthusiastic me. Even if at the end, the I dissolves into something greater. In the meantime, if our sense of self is wounded, or if we have low self-esteem or self-hatred, we're not going to be able to be the spiritual warrior on the path. We have to heal ourselves. When I do the loving-kindness meditation with college students, they're resistant to giving themselves loving-kindness. What can I tell them? You tell them, until you love yourself, you cannot love others. It would just be a dependency. If you don't have love for yourself, you will look to love someone else in the hope that they will love you back to make you feel complete. That's not love. That's just attachment, fear, and grasping. That's why romantic love is so iffy. Because it's based on the fantasy that somebody else can make me feel complete. That's nonsense. We have to make ourselves feel complete. And the only way to do that is to open up to oneself and in appreciation of oneself and encouragement of oneself, and to have a healthy sense of ego. Someone whose ego is damaged is always thinking about themselves. But people with a healthy ego don't think about themselves much because they have the space to think about everybody else. You'll notice that loving people don't take themselves so seriously. They are able to laugh at themselves. Humor is medicine and they know how to use it. Some people find it hard to practice loving kindness for themselves because they associate it with egotism. Tell them that it's not selfish or egoistic until they are at home with themselves and friendly towards themselves. How will they be that way with others? One thing I say to people is, listen to what you say to yourself, the way you talk with yourself. Would you talk like that to your best friend? 
Would you have any friends if you talked like that? If you would never talk to a friend like that, then why talk to yourself like that? We have to have love for all sentient beings. We are also sentient beings. And we are the sentient being we are most responsible for. So if we don't really love ourselves, where will it come from for another? All our talk about love will be just another form of clinging. It won't be genuine love. Because genuine love radiates from a light inside that radiates outward. But most people's idea of love is just grasping just attachment. Inside they're saying, I love you because you're going to make me happy. <laughs> that isn't love at all. It is wantingness and attachment. From romantic love to unconditional love, do men and women have different attachments to work through? Generally, men have to work on controlling sexual desire and women have to work with attachments to comfort and security, because that's what they biologically depend on for raising children. To reach the stage where you love the whole world, exactly like your own children, now that's really something. But it's rare. You don't love your own children less. You love the whole world more. So is there any value to romantic love? It keeps the species going. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about at a spiritual level? If you're attracted to someone and recognize that this is nature's lure to get you together, go beyond that and ask yourself whether you like the person. That's more important. If you truly like the person, then it can carry on. If you start only with romantic ideas, then it's so inflated that you can only come down. Underneath the sexual attraction, if you don't actually like the person, then there's nothing to build on. Sexual attraction is one thing, and love is quite another. Do you really want to be with this person for life? Do you have a lot to talk about? Do you have interests in common? How do they treat other people? Do you have the same values? It might start off as a fairy tale, but what happens to the frog and princess in that happily ever after when you have to look at each other across the breakfast table? Well, one would hope the falling in love experience opens a person to caring for someone and perhaps serves as a launching pad for unconditional love. In Buddhism, the model for perfect love is not romantic love. It's a mother with her child. Just as a mother loves her only child, that is how we want to feel toward all beings. The traditional loving-kindness meditation cultivates this kind of unconditional love. As set down by the Buddha, first we direct loving-kindness toward ourselves. May I be well and happy. May I be peaceful and at my ease. May I be free of suffering, and so forth. Then you think of the people you love, that you care for, such as your parents, partner, children, siblings, and good friends, and you wish them the same goodwill. May they be well and happy. May they be peaceful and at their ease, etc. Really wishing them all of these things. Then you think of people you feel neutral toward people you see every day, but don't have strong feelings about one way or the other, such as the postman, or someone in your office whom you don't know well or have any feeling about. You think of that one person and really imagine that person being happy and how wonderful it would be for him or her 
and for their family, really sending the person goodwill. And then you think of someone you have problems with, called the enemy, which means someone who pushes your buttons, and you really wish them to be happy and free of their suffering. In this way, love becomes unconditional and totally inclusive. When one single human heart develops that kind of extended love, do you think it helps the world at large? Of course, like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, whomever he meets, you can see his automatic thought is, may you be well and happy. And he's talking straight to the essence of the person, not to their persona. This radiance of love is very powerful. Generally, people are projecting so much thought pollution, which is far worse than the other pollution everyone is concerned about. If we could see it, we would see that this planet is in very bad shape because of the amount of violence, hate, greed, and envy emanating not only from the individuals, but also from movies, television, and newspapers. So any light that shines into darkness is bound to be very radiant. If you go to a holy place, you see the difference. It isn't polluted with hatred and so forth. I lived for several years near Assisi, Italy, where St. Francis lived. Even though it's highly commercialized, still, so many people have had profound spiritual experiences without realizing how it could have happened. In contrast, if you go to Auschwitz, you don't even have to know what happened there to know that it was something horrible. It's there, it's tangible. So yes, anything we can do to radiate light and love into the universe is bound to benefit everyone. This is the idea within Catholicism and other religions that have contemplative orders or any group of people coming together quietly to radiate something positive to the universe. It makes a big impact. Inner cultivation, deep polluting the mind and heart. What would you say to people who view contemplative practice as, well, impractical? For example, some parents of the college students that take a meditation class they ask their kids, why do you take a class where you sit and do nothing? What good does that serve? I would say that our actions and our speech, which definitely have an influence on the world, depend upon our mind. Everything depends on the mind and the way we see things. The reason the world is in such a horrible state today is not the world's fault. It's the fault of the beings that inhabit the world. And not the lions and the tigers, but the humans. The world is run by people with polluted minds. This means we can't see correctly. How does a person start to unpollute the mind? First of all, by recognizing that there is a pollution. And you can only recognize that by looking at it, going within. This is the benefit of meditation or any contemplative practice. So first, you get your mind a little calmer, more attentive and focused. And then you turn your focus inward and observe the thoughts. What kinds of thoughts are there? Not judging the mind, but really looking at it. Whoa, what thoughts? And learning how not to identify with the thoughts so much. Most people somehow believe that they are their thoughts and emotions and beliefs and memories. 
but they need to recognize that this is just an ephemeral flow, like a movie projected onto a screen. It isn't reality. And then you get back into contact with the underlying awareness which sees that. That's what we have to go back to, our pure awareness, and stop identifying with the thinking process. Of course we can think, but first we need to recognize that we are not our thoughts, only have thoughts. We see those thoughts that are wholesome and lead to happiness, and we see those thoughts that are like poison and create problems all around. When we see the difference, then we can encourage the good thoughts and start weeding out the poisonous ones. It's like weeding the garden. You water good plants and you pull out the weeds. That way, gradually, the mind begins to unpollute. Then one's speech will reflect one's thoughts and one's actions will follow from there with more skill, more clarity and based on a good heart instead of a polluted heart. It's obvious. You know this very well. But most people try to change things on the outside. They don't understand that it has to start from inside. It's good that you are teaching this knowledge to your students. Even if they just get a taste, they will know that this is something genuine at last. You travel and teach a lot in the West. What would you say is something that we Westerners are totally missing on the topic of love? In general, people in the West are too much in the head and need to come down into the heart, which is the seat of our true self. Inner transformation will only take place when the arena of action is brought down to the heart center. You will notice that when we reference our personhood, we point to the center of our chest, not the head. There is also the problem that we were saying earlier. Most people don't know what love is. They confuse love with attachment. They think the more they are attached to a person, this proves how much they love them. And they think that non-attachment means that you're cold. Sometimes when people ask me, what's the difference between love and attachment? I say, attachment is the thought, I love you, so therefore I want you to make me happy. Love says, I love you, and I want you to be happy, whether it includes me or not. And your own mother? Wasn't she an example of unconditional love? She was an absolute example of it. She wanted me to be happy, and if that did not include her in the picture, she was happy because I was happy. Was that hard for her? You were her only daughter, and she hardly saw you. Perhaps it was hard for her but she didn't make it hard for me. She acted as though she were happy. She never wrote, I miss you, please come back. Every 10 years she would write to ask, if I send you a return ticket, will you please come back for a month? And she told some friends of mine who told me later, she always prayed that in the next lifetime, she would come back again as your mother because she was afraid that otherwise you wouldn't have parents who would understand that you needed a special sort of life. That is real love. She would have been happy to go through it all again, because she wanted me to be happy. How to handle difficulty and suffering. Does an understanding of karma help dissolve resentments from childhood and the hardships of life? It could, but there's a lot of resistance in the West to accepting responsibility for anything that goes wrong in our lives. 
we're happy to accept responsibility for anything good. We take credit for the good things as if we are the sole reason they occurred. But anything that goes wrong for us, we run from all responsibility. We blame something or someone outside of ourselves. We don't want to admit that we have anything to do with the problems or hardships in our life, let alone that maybe we created the causes and conditions for them in past lives. Usually I say to people, look, from a Buddhist perspective, we've had endless lifetimes in all forms, in all genders, in all nationalities, up and down, everywhere. During that time, we have done just about everything, good, bad, and indifferent. We've done it all. You name it, we've done it at some point. So, all those seeds of our intentional actions are buried, and they will come up when causes and conditions are right for them to come up. Therefore, bad things happen to good people, and good things happen to bad people. It's futile to ask, why me? What did I do to deserve this? These questions are from a victim viewpoint of tragic misfortune. Yes. My teacher taught me to say, forgive the one in me who did this to others. Whenever I encountered something that feels like an injustice, he said to say that to myself. Forgive the one in me who did this to others. Yes, that's a recognition of your own part. The fact is that at some point or another, we created these causes that are now being purified. And therefore, the best thing to do is respond skillfully, which means not being resentful, upset, and angry, but to ask, in this situation, how can I act in a way that will transform this hardship onto the path? So, we should take advantage of the difficulties in our life? Absolutely. If we don't take everything onto the path, then there is no path. As we all know, when we look back on our lives, it's often the most difficult parts where we learned the most. Someone said that life is a gymnasium for the soul. You go to the gym to work out not lie around on the mattresses. You have this equipment that challenges the body so that you can become strong. In that way, as one lama said to me when I was complaining about obstacles, if you call it an obstacle, it's an obstacle. If you call it an opportunity, it's an opportunity. It's what you make of it. Well, Westerners resist seeing any karmic context for physical suffering, such as poverty or racism. Yes, but if you were a rich landlord and exploited your peasants, where are you going to end up? Who knows? You're not laying blame. All you're saying is that we've all done terrible things and it's going to come up at some point. It doesn't mean that just because you are in a poor, abusive relationship, you have to remain in that relationship. You may also have a bit of karma to get the help to get out of it. In the meantime, instead of blaming the government or this or that, you can work with it. If I know someone who's suffering on some level, let's say physically, emotionally, financially, what would be a skillful and compassionate response to that? It depends. I would do Tonglen. Then you can look at the situation. Is there anything that could be done to alleviate it? If so, then you do it. 
If there isn't, then you carry on with your Tonglen. Because we are all, as the Buddha said, heirs to our own karma, responsible for our past deeds. We cannot take on the karma of others. They have to go through it. Maybe they need to. Sometimes people pray to God, Jesus, Mary, or Tara, please let me be free of the suffering. But maybe it's necessary to suffer it. And maybe this is part of the pattern. The point is not to pray to remove anything that's nasty or that I don't like, but to have the courage and wisdom to deal with it skillfully and integrate it on my spiritual path. This doesn't mean that we don't help where we can. One of the shortcomings of the Buddhist attitude is that so often people just sit on their cushions thinking, may all beings be well and happy, but then they don't actually get out and do much. This is now being challenged in many Buddhist countries, and certainly in the West where there are a lot of people running hospices, working with street people, addicts, and in prisons. But sometimes, nothing can be done. We also have to remember that this is samsara. And samsara, by its very nature, is not satisfactory. We have to accept that since the beginning of time, People have been poor, they have been sick, they have been miserable. And this is not going to change in the near future because we are not creating the causes for it to change. This is the problem. As a race, we humans are creating negative karma. How can we expect peace and well-being when we're not sowing the seeds for peace and well-being? Until we change our whole attitude and actions, things will not get any better. That's why it's important to teach young people to understand the inner basis. They realize the change starts within. This is a great hope. Devotional love to a teacher or guru. What about devotional love to a spiritual teacher? It is always tricky because that kind of devotion is a total openness and surrender. And one has to be very careful in being open and devotional. People were very devoted to Hitler. He was a god to them. People often are attracted like moths to a flame when it comes to charisma, but charismatic people aren't necessarily good. So, the first thing is to have discrimination. In the tantric texts, it says one should examine the guru for up to 12 years. Of course, people don't, but that's the advice. The Dalai Lama says that, if possible, you should spy on your guru. In other words, look at him not when he's sitting on his throne or being the great omniscient teacher, but rather, what is he like behind the scenes with the people who are of no benefit to him? How does he treat ordinary people in private? Is his heart genuinely only for the benefit of helping others, or is it just another big ego trip? Often, people with inflated or shiny egos are very attractive, and it's hard for an ordinary person to discern this sort of thing when they are desperately looking for someone to believe in and trust. That's the first challenge, to have some discrimination and not become a groupie. The whole point of devotion is that it's an absolute openness and total trust. So, one has to be discriminating. But 
If you do happen to find someone who is worthy of that trust and is able to understand the students better than they understand themselves, and to guide them skillfully, then from the point of view of the students, it's good to open to that blessing. It's like if you compared the genuine teacher to the sun. The sun is always shining, but it's up to us whether or not we pull up the blinds to let in the light. If we close all the shutters and then say, it's dark, that's not the fault of the sun. From our side, what we need to do is trust when we have understood that this is truly someone whom we can trust. How did you know that you could trust your guru? I say all this about the need for discrimination, and then, with my guru, just hearing his name was enough. In fact, I asked him to be my teacher and to take refuge with him without even knowing what he looked like. I was too frightened to look at him. I was just looking at the bottom of his robe and brown shoes. I didn't know whether he was old or young, fat or thin, anything about him at all. I just knew that he was my teacher. When I did look at him, there was this very strong feeling of meeting someone again whom I had known very well. So, was it a recognition? A recognition, together with that very strong sense that the innermost part of my being had suddenly taken material form in front of me. Only with him did that ever happen. Never with anyone else. He was immaculate. He was really a Buddha. So that was fortunate. Nonetheless, having said that, I do not advise people to go around looking for that. I advise people to be very careful because I so often see people who inwardly were badly injured by trusting in someone who was not trustworthy. A lot of books go on about how the student should act toward the guru, but very few books tell how the guru should act. Their guidelines. My teacher would say to his students, Let me tell you what my responsibility is as a teacher. So he emphasized the freedom of the student and the karmic accountability of the teacher. Exactly. Very few people think about that. How do you handle the people who look to you as a teacher? I'm not a teacher. Okay, but they do have that devotion towards you. That's their problem. Okay, but how do, you, how do you handle it? I say very clearly that I am not a teacher. I don't have the qualifications. Do you mean enlightenment? Yes and even an understanding of their needs. I don't have those qualities. I would be fooling them and fooling myself if I pretended to be a teacher when I'm not one. I offer talks that give people some general pointers, and then they can go off and find someone to take them further. And people come here because they are confused. And I try to give them a little clarity for the next step so they can keep going forward. That's all. Mostly my energies are taken up running this nunnery. In the nunnery, I'm not their teacher. So then what are you? An administrator. The nuns have their lamas at Tashi Jong Monastery near here. They have teachers for philosophy who teach them every day, and other teachers. I just kind of keep things going.
to encounter Jetsumna Tenson Palmo in monastic robes, shaved head, and piercing blue eyes was like meeting my brother, my sister, my father, my mother, my superior, my friend, myself, all in the same person. After meeting with her, I felt like I'd been in a meditation hall. I felt calmer and more at peace. I felt clearer about what life is really all about. In her presence, the mud settled. The time was now. I heard the urgency to go within. Stop. Take a look at yourself. Your motive, your attitude, your heart. Before you add something to the water of life, make sure it's not contaminated with your confusion, greed, and anger. My last question to Tinson Palmo. What's the most important thing that I can do for the world? And she said, recognize and develop your own innate wisdom. Everything flows from there. And this is the power of practice according to Buddhism. We become the fruition of the seeds that we cultivate in our inner garden.